Well, it's Father's Day, so we need some good Father's Day humor, right? So let me, can I get an amen? Huh? Here's one. It says, for Father's Day, we got my dad a t-shirt that says, do not resuscitate. He wears it whenever mom takes him to the ballet. <laughs> Here's a day, Bear, you said, I enjoy Father's Day. It's, time when I, it's a time when I pause to reflect on the joy that has come into my life thanks to my two wonderful children whose names escape me. <laughs> I got my dad a GPS, Melanie says, for Father's Day. Now someone other than my mom can tell him where to go. <laughs> and then the last is, on Father's Day, I'm doing something my dad... I'm doing something for my dad that he's wanted for years. I'm getting a job. <laughs> well, Father's Day and Father's is no laughing matter. They are no laughing matter. <sighs> the, the role of a father is so critical today. Uh, I think Satan's greatest tool is to undermine the whole role of a father and to remove the father from the home. Um, We've all witnessed it at some point. We've all perhaps participated at some point. It, it happens every summer. It's when fathers get in the pool with their children, and perhaps several fathers at any event, and they hoist their child, a boy, girl, on, the, on their shoulder, and then they have to play the game, no man left standing, or the last man left standing, I believe it is, or something to that nature, and you know how it goes. You know, the kids on top, uh, uh, on your shoulder, they're fighting, they're trying to dismantle the other person, knock them off the father's shoulders, and you're trying to leverage them, and you're trying to move your feet, and you're trying to maneuver in such a way that your child can have an advantage in terms of leverage and so forth. Well, fatherhood is really a lot about carrying your children on your shoulder, it, leveraging in such a way so that they have an advantage, keeping the stability in your life, keeping your focus. And if you lose your footing, your children can lose your, their footing as well. They can fall. Now, we're not here today to pass a lot of guilt on fathers. There is no perfect father, and the greatest father there ever was has more wayward children than anyone else. That's our Heavenly Father. But we need to understand that the role of a father is very critical. And so today I want to speak to all men, not just fathers. If you came in today thinking this is a message that, that's just for fathers, this is, forget that. This is a message to all men, whether you are a father or whether you're going to be a father at some point, some place and time. Or even if you are a father in which your children have grown up, they're out of the home, and you're thinking, now nah, you're, you're either a, a grandfather or you're thinking about, you know, uh, the fact that you're done with that. Um, here's a reason. I think that even as a grandfather, if your children allow you, uh, you have a role in mentoring them, especially if you have sons who are fathers. And, and so I, th we think, I, I think we need men who understand how to be a father and who are willing to mentor even if you don't mentor your own children you can mentor other men's like we we have a good number of young men here who are serious about the lord and and they want to be mentored and so we want to talk about you know what is the role of the father and especially today what i want to talk about are some things that can undermine your footing keep you from becoming or being the kind of father that you need to be now the place to go is to James chapter 1. In fact, I think James could have written right across the, the first chapter for men only because there are things in James that all fathers deal with, some things they deal with some of the time, some things they deal with all of the time. For example, in verse 5, it says, but if any of you lack wisdom or lacks wisdom, uh, there speaks of anyone who has, saw, has gone to the Lord to find wisdom. And I think every man at some point in, his, in time, if he's a good father, he has sought out the wisdom of the Lord concerning his children, concerning how to be a good parent. Another thing is in verse 6, that verse right after that, it says, but he must ask in faith without doubting, 
For he, the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. Uh, any fathers, any of you ever doubted? Sure you have. Perhaps you've doubted your faith at times. Perhaps you've doubted your significance at times. And perhaps you've doubted yourself as a father, whether you were adequate or not. And then in verse 9, it says, But the brother of humble circumstance is to glory in his high position. I don't think there's a, a man here who hasn't been in a humble circumstance at some point in their life. So men have had to deal with that. But as we move on in this passage, we come to some things that they don't deal, uh, things that you deal with all the time. The, the previous things are things that you deal with perhaps on and off. But the next two things I think we deal with as men all of the time, or most of the time. For example, in verse 12, it says, Blessed is a man who perseveres under trial. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Trials. Is there any man here who hasn't gone through trials? We deal with that all the time, do we not? As one pastor said, there are only two types of Christians. Those who are in trials, going through trials, and those who are about to go through. Isn't that often true? The Christian life is the most exciting and exhilarating experience here on this earth. It is also the most difficult. Can I get an amen on that? Yeah. And you see, God uses that, those trials and testings in our lives, to bring us to a place of total commitment, full commitment. We don't like that, but that's what he does. He, he does that because he knows that when we hurt, we turn to him, unfortunately. And what did the psalmist say? A few are the afflictions of the righteous. Is that what he said? Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. Now, another thing we face is in verse 13. It says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted of God, for God cannot be tempted by evil. He himself does not tempt anyone. Another thing that we face all the time as men is that of temptation. Temptation that can lead us apart and sever our relationship apart from God and sever our relationship with him. All men will face that constantly. Today I want to talk to you, though, about a different kind of temptation. Some of the temptations that I'm going to talk about today are not things that will cause you to lose your fellowship with God, but they will undermine your relationship with your children at times. And so what I want to do today is, uh, we're going to get to these temptations, but what I want to do today is, I have three goals. I, I first want to encourage you men. Uh, those who know me well know that I'm probably tougher on men than I am on women when it comes to the Word of God. But I want to encourage you. Secondly, I want to stand alongside of you. I don't want to stand above you. I, the things I'm going to share with you today when we get to the practical side of this message will be painfully honest as far as I'm concerned because I'll be sharing some of the struggles I've had as a father. And the third thing I want to do is I do want to challenge you fathers or who may become a father at some point to move beyond mediocrity, to move beyond just getting a by. So many fathers today just kind of get by. And I want to challenge you to move beyond that today. Now, before we get to these, these top temptations of fathers, I want us to look at the, the, the pathology of a temptation, the nature of a temptation, if you will. They're found right in James chapter 1, verse, beginning of verse 13. And we're just going to do a flyover of these. We're not going to spend a lot of time on each of these. But basically, I want to set the stage for what we're about to talk about towards the end of the message. The end of the message is going to be extremely practical. First thing is that temptation is never directed by God. Look in verse 13 again. It tells us clearly that God is not one who causes temptation. This statement was given to deal with a heresy that the Jews had in this time. The heresy was, it was something in fact that they had come up with based on their own subjective thinking, not based upon biblical truth. 
And that is the essence of where does evil come? From which, where does evil come? You see, they held the view that there were two forces in man. The Yetzer Hatab, which was the good force, and then there was the Yetzer uh, Huda. It looks like Hurrah, but it's Huda, which spoke of the evil source. Now, that only named just what they believed, but then there was a struggle about where did this come from? And so there were three school of thoughts. One was that Satan put it in man. Another thought was that fallen angels put it in man, the evil force. And the last was that man put it in man. But it still didn't answer the question. What was the source of evil? What is the source of that old nature in man? And so what they concluded was if God created everything, if he created this universe and he created man, then he must have created that evil force in man. And so James wrote this to combat that thinking. Because look at verse 13 again. He said, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted by evil. A couple of interesting things about that statement. No one is emphatic in the Greek text, the original Greek text. It's emphatic. But what's even more important, I think, is when it says, let no one say, in the Greek text, you won't see this in the English, but here's the color here. In the Greek text, it has a negative with a present imperative. Imperative is a command, right? We know that. But when you put a negative on the front of, of a command, it means something even more than what you often read. What it means here is, stop doing what you're doing. So he was saying, James was saying, stop saying that God tempts us. Stop blaming God for your sin. Uh, uh, several years ago, there was a young Christian female artist who was, spent a week in a recording studio with a country singer. Some of you know of whom I speak. She said, and, and the reason this is kind of fresh on my mind, I was sitting in an office the other day waiting and uh, someone had a magazine, and this person, these people were talking about the relationship. And she, basically, she said that whole week that she was in this recording studio with this country singer, even though she's married, he's married, she said it was electric. It was unbelievable. She said the chemistry between us was just, whoa! And essentially insinuated that it was God's will and direction here. James is writing to this to say, stop that. Stop. Stop right now. That kind of stuff. Stop blaming God. Hmm. Solomon said, the foolishness of man subverts his way and his heart rages against the Lord. Hmm. Secondly, another thing about temptation is temptation is inevitable. Temptation is inevitable. Again, verse 13, it says, let no one say, what? Read that word with me out loud. When he is tempted. When he, it didn't say if he's tempted, it says when he is tempted. It assumes that we will be tempted, does it not? I mean, there's some Christians who would say, you know, if you make the right adjustment, you arrange your life, you can avoid all temptation, and thus you can avoid all sin. Is that true? No. No, the monk behind the walls in the monastery is just as tempted as the businessman in Los Angeles or New York. Why? Because the heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Do you remember I said that a few weeks ago? The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. We all have diseased hearts that want to go its own way. Oh, we like sheep. We've been talking about our Lord as a shepherd. All we like sheep have gone astray. There was a boy, about nine years of age, sitting in, on a fence looking at this tree filled with apples on the other next door neighbor's property. This farmer appeared suddenly and he said, Sonny, are you trying to steal my apples? And he said, no, I'm not tr trying uh, to steal your apples, but my nut is not very good right now. Uh, you see, the nature inside of us defies the sign that says, keep off the grass. It wants to partake of the forbidden fruit. When you see a sign that says, wet cement, 
what do you want to do? When it says wet cement, keep off. I have somebody in my family that has, that's a great temptation of hers. Uh, I won't name her name, but her initials are Debbie Morgan. Um, <laughs> I'll pay for that one. Uh, <laughs> no. Well, again, that's the nature of man. The nature of man is, again, that we are pulled away. It's inevitable that we'll face temptation. Thirdly, temptation leading to sin always follows the same pattern. Look in verses 14 and 15. It says, but to each one is tempted when he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Now that phrase, those words carried away and enticed by one's own lust, those are fishing terms. Carried away, that phrase, speaks of, of fish, pulling a fish out from its hiding place. Enticed is a Greek word which means to lure. And it's significant to note that the, thing, the things that they put on the end of the fishermen, that they put on the end of their line, what are they called? Lures. That's the idea that's used here. The world system will lure us away from the things, not just the things of God, but from the things that, now get this, the things that are most important in our lives. The tyranny of the urgent will cause us to settle for good when we could, settle to, could have settled for be, what's best, what God has that's best. Uh, here's the last. Temptation leading to sin brings about death. Look in verse 15 again. It says, then when, he, when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Now, there are two births that are mentioned here. First is the evil desire gives way to sin. And then sin gives way to what? It says death. In fact, it's interesting that the word give, the phrase give birth, uh, the root idea of that is that of ceasing of a, of a pregnancy coming to an end. Implicit in that idea is the fact that sin runs its full course, just like the embryo grows in the, uh, the, the mother's womb. Uh, so sin grows, and when it comes forth, it gives birth, but not to life, but to death. My mind, as I read this, always immediately runs to Proverbs 16, 25, that says, There is a way that seemeth right within man. What? But the end thereof is destruction. Death is a word, the idea. I was listening to a, a well-known Christian Bible teacher this week on radio, and he made the comment. He said, I have a psychologist, a friend who's a psychologist, who's counseling a lot of people, and he says, he told me that he has a number of clients who are either going, are in, involved in an affair, or they've just gone through an affair. They've just brought, brought it to an end. And he said, the psychologist said to him, they're all miserable. They're all miserable. That's what happens. It looks good on the front, on the front end. It looks enticing, but the end is destruction. Now, that brings us to the, what I want to share with you in the, concerning temptations that fathers have. And again, some of these are not temptations that are going to sever your fellowship with God. But there are things that can undermine your relationship with your children. And again, maybe you're already a parent. Uh, uh, I should say maybe you're, you're all, your children are already grown up and you're no longer kind of, you have them in the home, I guess I would say. It's still important that all of us understand these things because you can help others. The world is screaming at our young men saying this is what's important and we need to say no that's it's not now here's the first temptation it's a temptation to give your presence instead of your presence it's a temptation to substitute what I purchase for my family instead of giving them myself it's toys instead of time 
It's the temptation to say, well, I provide for my family. I provide all this stuff. It makes them happy, all these things. And don't get me wrong. It's nothing wrong with you should want to provide for your family. It's okay to provide nice things for your family. In fact, Paul told Timothy, young Timothy, that the one who doesn't provide for his family is worse, worse than an infidel. It's good to do that. But the problem is, is when it goes to the extreme, especially when you're tempted, <clears throat> excuse me, when you're tempted under the success time crunch. So what'd you say? I call it the success time crunch. That is when you have experienced a great degree or some degree of success and the neon lights in front of you will say, hey, look what you're doing. Imagine how much more successful you can be if you just give more time, more attention, more energy. It's an intoxicating aroma. It's an intoxicating lure. And so we rationalize again that if we provide for our kids, that's adequate. And so what happens? They come to us and they say, Dad, I've got a game uh, on Thursday night or Friday night. Or, Dad, I've got to play at school on Thursday night or whenever. Or, Dad, can you help me with my algebra? And what do they, they get? They get a busy signal. Now, is there anything any more annoying than a busy signal. And I know today in our technology that we don't hear that very much. We don't get busy signals because of call waiting and all that stuff. But I made a call the other day and I called the, that same number three times and I got a busy signal. And it was annoying. <laughs> Gordon MacDonald in the book The Effective Father quotes an unknown author really that author, whoever he was, said, the too busy father tends to give his children money instead of time because he has more money than time. By this single act, he warps both their sense of practical values and family values. It takes a dedicated parent to cancel golf, cocktail parties, and trips to the city to spend time in ordinary talk with his young. In a pressurized world, engagements with one's own children are most easily postponable. Mm, what a statement. Jesus in Luke 12 said, For a man, a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of things which he possesses. Jesus drew a line between a man's life and what he possessed. And men, young men, it is the life that our children long to have, need, are hungry to have. My younger son was 10 years of age. He started getting into fishing. And at the time, I pastored a church named Community Church of Portage Lakes in Ohio. That church was right in the center of 13 man-made lakes. It was a summer haven. I didn't have to go very far to go fishing, to take my son fishing. And my son asked me one day, he said, would you take me fishing? And so I put it off, put it off, finally got around to it, took him fishing. And, uh, and I don't know much about fishing, I've gone a few times, but and we sat there, didn't catch, he caught something, but didn't catch anything. We didn't talk a whole lot. And I drove away thinking, what a wasted day. That Sunday, someone in our church asked my son, how'd it go? Heard you went fishing with your dad. What'd you think? He said, man, it was great. It was great, a wonderful day. I don't know if he used that word, but he's something like that. Hmm. Men, there is, there is nothing that substitutes for your presence in the bleachers at the school play 
or even helping your child do algebra or whatever it is, even though they may know more of that, know more about it than you do. I made sure that I attended most every event that our children had. My older son ran track, he ran cross country. In the four or five years that he ran that in middle school and then in the high school, I only missed two track meets. And here's why. Because when your children, when you're overly involved in your business and your kids may complain, they will simply say, it's your job. And they may not like your job. But when pastor kids complain about dad being too involved, it's God also that they resent. And I wasn't a perfect parent, but I only missed two of those events. Children will quickly forget, listen to this, children will quickly present, uh, forget your presence, what you give to them. They will never forget your presence. Here's the second. They give the family emotional leftovers. All dads have a limited amount of emotional resources, in other words, creativity, humor, skills, enthusiasm. The temptation, now here's the temptation. The temptation is to save all of that, the best, for our, the workplace. And then we give our family, when we come home, the leftovers. You know how it goes. You, you crawl, drag in under the door, and you plop, out, it, it plop into the chair, your best chair, and you... And your children are going, Dad, Dad. Uh, when I first started out in ministry in Riverside, California, I was a young pastor. And of course, young pastor, you're not sure about what's going on. You're trying to be successful. You're trying to you know, do what's right. And so you spend a lot of hours. And I would initially, when our, I had two young boys at the time, and um, I initially would come into the house, eat, and then fall into my, I have my special chair in the family room, right, so I could see television. And I'd pick the, up the newspaper. I used, to love, I used to love reading the newspaper. And then it occurred to me, I can read the newspaper after these children have gone to bed. They need me on the floor playing with them. I came to another conclusion. Every Friday was my day off, and we homeschooled our children up to uh, all, of the, or all three of them at different stages, some all the way through, some one up to middle school. I concluded that Friday in my day off, that I would devote that, most, uh, that Friday most of the time to one of my children that we had at home, that we were homeschooling. I always said to myself, there will be days when they'll be gone from the house, and you'll have time to yourself. To dads who are drowning in the whole area of emotional strength, let me warn you. Take the words of James to heart. Do not be deceived. Take a close look at the stuff to which you give yourself to outside of the home. A weekend, men, will not substitute for every weeknight. Dad, your wife can't take your place. Now, I understand. I know, I know. There are times and seasons in your job that you have to devote more time to that job. I understand that. And, mo and, and mothers and wives, that, that's something that you have to accept as well. But I, I use the word season. Season means that that season comes to an end at some point. Here's the third, and boy, this one stings. <laughs> Can we just skip this one? Um, this is to, del to deliver lectures rather than earning the right to be respected. To deliver lectures rather than earning the right to be respected by listening and learning. This is a temptation to come in, remember you're worn out, to come in and to start lecturing before you listen to what's going on. And so you see things that are out of order at home. What do you do? And so immediately you move into action and you begin to lecture. <sighs> I 
Oh, this is painful. And you know, I would do that. And uh, we'll get to that in a minute. (laughs) But you know, there's no place in Scripture that says that the office is an extension of the home. Or the home is an extension of the office, I should say. There's no place in Scripture that says that your wife and children are employees. You see, respect comes the hard way. You have to earn it. Remember that, man. We don't have respect simply because we wear the title of father. Can I say that again? We don't have respect from our children and wife simply because, or deserve that, simply because we wear the title of father or husband. Look at James 1.19. It says, This you know, my beloved brethren, but everyone must be quick to hear, slow to speak, and slow to what? Anger. What do we do? We reverse that, don't we? We come in at night, we're tired, and we're, we reverse it. We're quick to anger, quick to speak, slow to hear. Is that not true? I noticed, I noticed with my children that when I would begin to lecture them, they would get real quiet. And you know, I thought some of those lectures were quite eloquent. I mean, I waxed eloquently and I thought, man, I just, that should have blown them away, man. They're going to walk away thinking, hey, man, I'll never do that again. You know what they did? When they found, saw their mother, he said, they said, Dad's preaching again. <laughs> That's why I say it's painful. And you know, the problem with that, I'd see Debbie, or hear Debbie getting, you know, getting on their case about the same thing two weeks later, saying almost the same thing I said. They never said a word. I said, what is it with that? I mean, what, what is it, my voice, my tone of voice? What is it? I'm, I'm preaching and they don't say anything. You, you know, I finally figured that one out. I think. <laughs> <laughs> they know that mother listens. We dads don't listen. We don't always listen. When I approached them under control, it was amazing the respect I would get from them. And sometimes in our family conferences that we would have in our living room, uh, sometimes I would even drop my voice and they would kind of lean forward. What are you saying? But they would listen. And even times when perhaps anger was appropriate, they would accept it. But one of the things I learned is that anger is seldom appropriate. Why? Because we, oftentimes we respond in anger because we don't have the facts. That's not always true, but sometimes. I remember one time I walked in the house and my two boys, were, when they were small, they were fighting. I grabbed the one that looked the guiltiest, carried him into the room, got the paddle, spanked him, Walked out of the room, did all that, you know, all that stuff. You know, you, you spank them and you put the pedal down. You talk to them, tell them how much you love them and all that stuff. Good stuff. And then Debbie said, you spanked the wrong one. <laughs> you see, that's, that can happen when we come home exhausted, running on fumes, and we're giving the family the leftovers. We don't have enough energy to stay under control. Here's the fourth. To demand that all be perfect. This is the desire to be personally perfect and to demand it from all others in the family. You say, well, I'm not overboard on that one. I'm pretty good with that. Can we move on? Let me ask you a few questions, okay? Okay. Do you expect the absolute best of yourself at all times? Did you, do you put off taking on a project because you don't have the time to do it perfectly? Do you get upset with yourself when you can't do things perfectly? 
Do you get upset with others because they can't understand your desire to get things done right? Are you hard on yourself when you make a mistake? Are you doubly hard on yourself when you make that same mistake twice? Are you emotionally disappointed with others because of their lack of perfection in their work? Is the idea of being average distasteful to you? Do you often think on, when you finish a project, do you often think, I could have done that better? You see, perfectionists tend towards extremes. It's either outstanding or it's worthless. There's no middle ground. Perfectionists tend to minimize success and they maximize failures. They're the person who's depressed because they didn't get salesman of the year even though they just got salesman of the month. There's always something more to be gained. And they put that on their family. Let me ask you, do you give your children room to fail? Will you give your ch children room to fail? Do you give your wife room to fail? Folks, failure is a great teacher. It's a great teacher. You know how many elections Abraham Lincoln lost before he be won, became president? Take my word for it, a bunch. And arguably one of the two greatest presidents in the, of the United States. I um, consulted our um, baseball guru here, Paul Adams, this week. I asked Paul, Paul, how many, how many 400 hitters are there in the Hall of Fame? He wrote back 14. 14 400 hitters in the Hall of Fame. That's not very many. Four, 400 hitters means that every 10 times, out of every 10 times they come to bat, four times they get, they get a hit in which they get on base without someone committing an error. So four out of 10 times. In fact, I discovered that in the Hall of Fame, there are a lot of guys there who batted three in the 300s. And there are, in fact, amazingly, a good number who batted in the 200s. Do you give your children, or will you give your children room to bat 300, 3 out of 10? You know, one of the hardest things for me to do was to allow my teenage boys, uh, uh, allow them to mow the lawn. Part of the reason was sometimes when the lawnmower came back, it was not functioning. <laughs> But it was so hard for me to, uh, I, I always mowed the lawn, and I, I want it done right. And it was so hard for me to allow them to mow the lawn without saying, well, you missed a spot over here. Uh, uh, no, you missed a whole section over there. Instead of saying, hey, great job. Great job. Thank you. Hmm. It's not that you want them to be you don't want them to be righteous, or better yet, godly. You want them to be righteous and godly. But remember, even the godly do not bat 1,000%. Tom Peters in the book In Search of Excellence said, a special attitude of the success-oriented, positive, and innovative environment is a substantial tolerance for failure. We can be so rigid at times. Here's... The fifth, sexual temptation. It's seeking satisfaction and gratification outside the, the bond of marriage. Sometimes it is a result of feeling gratified by somebody else telling you that you're wonderful and great, and et cetera, et cetera. And please don't sit in pride because you've never had an affair and you've told your inner circle it will never happen. Please don't think that. Maybe you haven't and maybe you never will. But temptation is there. And for anyone who says, I, I'm never tempted and I'll never be tempted with that, uh, it's foolish. It's foolish. 
Then look in verse 13. It tells you again, it says, we can't blame God. Sometimes I hear believers saying, no, if God hadn't led me to this hotel, or if God hadn't made me take this trip, or if God hadn't caused my high school sweetheart to contact me on Facebook, or if God had given me this, had not given me this extra time, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And so people blame God. That's why this is, this is why I touched on this earlier. Does God cause temptation? No. Does he allow it? Yes. And sometimes he puts it right in our face. And he says, master it. Conquer it. And here's why I think he does that. Because until we can master our passions, the passions of our lives, we will never be able to master the life of the master. Let me say that one more time. Until we can master the passions of our lives, we will never, never be able to master the life of the master in our lives. Remember again, the word for entice means to draw out by a bait. According to scientists, Arctic polar bears feed solely on seals. And it's interesting how they do that. Seals, if they are on the ice, and if their hole in the ice is close to the edge of the ice, polar bears will take a deep breath, they'll go under the ice, close to the hole where the seal may be, and they'll begin making a scratching sound on the bottom side of the ice. Of course, the seal jumps in thinking it's a fish, thinking he has supper, not knowing that he is going to be supper. Hmm. If we're not careful, if we toy and hang around the barn, when it comes to this issue, we will fall. Here's a guarantee. One of my mentors died shared this with me years ago. Here's how you, how you resist it. When tempted, walk it all the way through. And then as you walk it all the way through, think about your wife and your children and think about seeing them face to face and how you would feel. My mentor also told me when I asked him how he dealt with temptation, he says, I also have a list in the front of my Bible of all the people that I would let down if I were to fall morally. Dr. Joe Alridge, who was president of Multnomah School of the Bible before he died, and I read a story about him recently after he died. They said that Joe had 100 names in the front of his Bible for that reason. If you travel a lot, take a picture of your family. If a woman is tempted to come onto you or she's, you know, whatever, show them a picture of your family. Diedrich Bonhoeffer once said, it's not that Satan brings us to the place of hating God in order to tempt us. It's that he causes us to forget God. Oh, wow. Hmm. Here's the last. It is to underestimate the importance of cultivating spiritual appetites. Did we get appetites? Uh, should be appetites. I'm sorry, Diana didn't correct that. And Ephesians 6, 4 says, Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. So often as a father, when our children come to us, we'll say, go talk to your mother. She's the one who's all about church. She's the one that's all about the Bible. She, she knows more. But notice in Ephesians 4, it says, fathers, you're the one to bring them up in the discipline, in the nurture, the instruction of the Lord. Mothers do it, but fathers, this clearly says we are to be involved in it. Let me ask you, when was the last time you said, let's go to church? When was the last time you said, let's pray together? When was the last time you said that, you know, in, this is marvelous, in this book is marvelous wisdom, and we're going to find God's direction for our life in this book?
Now, I'm not talking about some fanatical fathers who, whose spiritual needle is on overkill. I'm not talking about that. We're not talking about that at all. The, the goal is not hypocrisy, but authentic manhood, Christianity, authentic Christianity. So those are the temptations. And Father, I hope you, fathers, I hope you'll leave today encouraged. And young men, I hope that you'll take these things to heart. One of the best things you can do is hear as much as you can God's biblical truth before you are become a father.